Welcome, everyone. Let's begin our lesson for today by going over the learning goals and success criteria. First, what are we learning? We're learning how to recognize patterns in number sequences, how to determine the factors of composite numbers, how to understand the concept of closure on finite sets, how to use tables and examples to determine if a set is closed, how to recognize that division by zero is always undefined, how to recognize all numbers as being part of the number system, how to determine which number set within the number system a number belongs, how to recognize that numbers can belong to multiple number sets at the same time, and how to recognize closure of number sets within the number system under mathematical operations. How are we learning it? Through the reasoning with integers review notes and the reasoning with integers review assignment. When can we use this information? To divide a check at a restaurant among multiple people, to perform simple calculations such as a budget by recognizing boundaries of numbers to determine if adding the items in your budget will stay within your income amount, and to understand how number sets are affected by mathematical operations throughout the remainder of this course. How do you know you learned it? By getting a score of four on the reasoning with integers review assignment. Now let's take a look at our agenda for today. We will begin by going over the learning goals and success criteria. While we do that, you'll fill out your get it started. After that, we'll go over the reasoning with integers review notes, and then I'll give you time to complete the reasoning with integers review assignment. At the end of class, we'll go back over our learning goals and success criteria while you fill out your before you go. Your only homework for tonight is continue working on the reasoning with representations of function study guide and any incomplete assignments that you may have. Let's take a look now at the reasoning with integers review notes. The notes begin with the learning goals and success criteria. Now, let's talk about what the locker problem actually says. So it says there are 100 lockers in a school hallway and they're all closed. 100 students come through the hallway and start opening and closing the lockers. The first student opens all the lockers. So all of them were closed, now all of them are opened. The second student closed every second locker. So they would close the second, the fourth, the sixth, and so on. The third comes and changes the state of every third locker. Well, change of the state means that if it's open, they close it. If it's closed, they open it. So they would do 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, all the way through. The fourth student changes the state of every fourth locker. So that would be 4, 8, 12, 16, and so on. The fifth student changes every fifth, and so on, until the hundredth student changes only the hundredth locker. The question is, which lockers are open after all hundred students pass through the hallway? Now let's talk about some strategies that we can use to help us solve this. So first of all, think about it this way. Is there a mathematical formula? Is there any equation that you can think of that we can write to figure out which lockers are going to be open? And maybe you can't. That's fine, so we just move on to the next one. Is there a way we can sketch or draw a graph or something, some kind of visual aid to help us with this? And maybe there is, maybe there isn't for you. If there's not, move on to the next one. Can we break the question down into smaller chunks? So can we look at this instead of saying 100 lockers, maybe we do 20 lockers or 10 lockers and see if there's any patterns that we can recognize. If there's a pattern we can recognize, then we can try to expand it and make it for the bigger problem and see if it still works. And lastly, is there any actual patterns that just immediately jump out to you? So these are some strategies to consider. Here's a video that shows how we can break this down into a simpler problem. So it shows us how we can change the state of 10 lockers and see if we can figure out any patterns that exist. And then we can try to expand it back to 100 lockers and see if that works. All right, I'm going to show you one way to visualize how to do the locker problem. So I'm going to start with kind of a simplified visual method. As you can see, I have UNO cards because I always have UNO cards. Um, but I only have 10 of them, so I'm only going to pretend like we're doing 10 lockers. So we have uh, each of these represents a locker. They're all numbered, 1 through 10. So here's what we're going to do. Right now, they are all closed. So face down, you see the UNO. That means that they're closed. So these lockers are all closed. We're going to simulate what happens when uh, 10 students go through. So we're taking our locker problem and we're simplifying it. Instead of having 100 lockers with 100 students, we're going to do a smaller problem, okay? Okay, so student one is going to come through. Student one will change every locker. So student one is going to open every single locker. So now all of these are going to be face up, which means that they are all open. Okay, there's student one. Okay, next. Student two is gonna come through. 
Student two is only gonna change the state of the lockers that have a number that is a multiple of two. Okay, so it's gonna change the state of lockers two, four, six, eight, and 10. When we say change the state, it means that if it was open, it's gonna be closed. If it was closed, it's gonna open. Okay, so we're gonna change the state of locker two, of locker four, of locker six, of locker eight, of locker 10. Student three is gonna come in. Student three is gonna change the state of every locker whose number is a multiple of three. So count by threes, three, six, nine. So we're gonna change the state. If it was open, we're gonna close it. If it was closed, we're gonna open it. If it's open, we're gonna close it, okay? So student four comes through and will change the state of every locker whose number is a multiple of four, four and eight. So four is gonna go open, eight's gonna go open. Student five. Student five is gonna change the state of every locker whose number is a multiple of five. So five and 10. Notice at this point, we are starting with locker five, okay? When student six comes through, we're gonna start with locker six. That means that the lockers that have come before are, are frozen in place. Those are not gonna get changed again, okay? So one, two, three, and four are staying exactly where they are right now. They're never gonna get changed again because the student number is just gonna get bigger. We're never gonna hit one, two, three, and four again. All right, so student five is gonna uh, change the state of locker five and locker 10. Okay. I want you to imagine what would happen when student six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 came through. And then I want you to uh, fill out the next piece of information and tell me which lockers remained open. So here's an example of this in terms of practice. So it says, let's look at just the first 10 numbers or set 10 lockers. So student one opens locker one. So locker one just gets opened by student one and that's it. It's never gonna be changed again because student two is only gonna start with locker two. So student one will open locker one and it'll stay open. Now, locker number two, student one opens it and then student two closes it, so it's closed. Locker three, student one opens it, student three closes it, so it's closed. Locker four, student one opens it, student two closes it, student four opens it, it stays open. Locker five, student one opens it, student five closes it, it's closed. Locker six, so locker six is opened by student one, closed by student two, opened by student three, and closed by student six. So it's closed at the end. Locker seven is opened by student one and closed by student seven. So it's closed. Locker eight is opened by student one, closed by student two, opened by student four, and closed by student eight. So it's closed. Locker nine is open by student one, closed by student three, open by student nine, so it's open. And locker 10 is open by student one, closed by student two, open by student five, closed by student 10, so it is closed. So if we look at it then, we can see that the ones that are open at the end of this are lockers one, four, and nine. Well, what patterns do we notice about it? Well, if we notice all these other ones have an even number of factors, right? In order for it to open and close enough times, we have to have an even number of factors to, for it to be closed. And notice we have an odd number of factors here for it to be open. So what are the ways that we can get an odd number of factors? So we said that these were the ones that are open. And in order for them to have an odd number of factors, they need to be perfect squares because we need to have some kind of factor that's multiplied by itself. 
such as 9 is 1 times 9 and 3 times 3, but we don't duplicate 3, so we end up with an odd number of factors here. So therefore, it is open at the end. So they need to be perfect squares. Now, what does finite mean? Finite means a select number of elements. Therefore, a finite set means we can count the number of elements in a set. The opposite of this would be an infinite set, which means there are too many elements to count. Now, an example of what this looks like is this. S equals the set of negative 1, 0, and 1. Now, what that means is these are the only values in the set, and we can count them. There's 1, 2, 3 elements in the set. So that's a finite set. We can say that the set is exactly these numbers here. Notice there are exactly three elements in the set. Now, closure definition. What does closure mean? Closure under an operation means a set is considered to be closed if when that operation is performed on any two elements within the set, the result is also in the set. Okay, note that this must be true for all elements in the set. If there is even one case where the result falls outside the set, then it is considered to be not closed. Okay, so let's take a look at what this means. So here's an example. We have the set of negative 1, 0, and 1, and want to know, is it closed under addition? So what that means is, I'm going to take each of these elements, so like negative 1 and 1, and when I add them together, I get 0, which is in the set. So that's, that means that the set might be closed. If for some reason, though, I end up adding two numbers together, and the result is outside the set. So let's say I add something together, and I get 6. Well, 6 is not in the set, so therefore it is not closed. So an example of what would make the set closed would be negative 1 plus 1 equals 0. Because zero is in the set, it looks like it might be closed. Now, is there an example we can come up with that makes it out of the set? Well, if we add one plus one, because we do need to include it, it to plus itself. So one plus one equals two. Well, two is not in the set. Therefore, the set is not closed. And again, if there's even one example of this, so it doesn't matter that this part ended up inside the set. Because this one example is out of the set, then the whole set is not closed. So how do we account for all the possibilities? So we're going to create a table designed to combine all the possibilities. So we have our table here, like this, and then we're going to add up each of the values. So like here, we have negative 1 plus negative 1, which is negative 2. Then we have negative 1 plus 0, which is negative 1. We have negative 1 plus 1, which is 0. Then 0 plus negative 1, which is negative 1. And 0 plus 0, which is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. Then 1 plus negative 1 is 0. 1 plus 0 is 1. And 1 plus 1 is 2. And we can see that we have two examples that are not in the set. These two here, negative 2 and positive 2. Therefore, the set is not closed. And whenever we say that a set is not closed, we need to say why. The reason why the set is not closed is because of 1 plus 1 and negative 1 plus negative 1. Now, whenever we are checking closure by 0, a set is never closed as long as the set includes 0. It's because if I divide anything by 0, the result is undefined. So therefore, any time 0 is included in the set, the set cannot be closed under division. There's a video here that shows you how to check closure uh, for finite sets. So you can go ahead and watch that as well. Let's talk now about how we can check finite sets for closure. So all I did was create a table using Google Docs. So I created a 4x4 four four table. And then I just filled in the numbers of negative 1, 0, and 1, and negative 1, 0, and 1. And we could put any numbers in here to check for closure, whatever the set requires. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at if this is closed under addition. So the way we do this is we're going to take each of these numbers here along the top and add them to each of the numbers along the side. So this box here would be negative 1 plus negative 1. So negative 1 plus negative 1 we know is negative 2. Negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. 
And then zero plus negative one is negative one. Zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus one is one. One plus negative one is zero. One plus zero is one. And one plus one is two. So once we do that, we can see that we have two numbers here, this one and this one, that are not in the set. So therefore, we would say that this set is not closed. And we can do this with any numbers, or we can do it with any operation. So this could be multiplication. We can still do it with that. So it would just be negative one times negative one and zero times zero, and so on. So we could check our finite sets using these tables. And from there, we move on to our poster. And this is, goes with the assignment that you'll do on Desmos. So what I want us to do is we're gonna talk about the different parts of the number system and talk about them in terms of the way we learn them. So when you first start learning no, your numbers, most people don't start with negative six or negative two or something like that. Most of us start by counting, right? One, two, three, four, five. And that's what we start with. We call those the natural numbers. Those are the numbers that we learn naturally. Those are the first things that we learn. So we call those the natural numbers. And the symbol for natural numbers is N. So we use N to symbolize natural numbers. And some examples of this are one, two, three, four, right? That's what we learn first. Now, once we start talking about natural numbers and we start learning our numbers, after we know how to count up to 10, 20, 30, 40, the next thing we learn is there's a number that represents nothing. We have to add that in. When you say, how many apples do you have? We need to be able to say, I have no apples. So we learned that there was zero and we call that whole numbers whole numbers are n with the little subtext of zero so what that means is the natural numbers plus zero so that's what we learned we learned that there are natural numbers and then we learned there's zero so examples of this would be zero one two three four five etc now once we learned that there was zero the next thing we learned was, hey, there's numbers on the other side of zero also. We learned that there were negative numbers, and we call those integers. And the symbol for integers is Z. So these include all the whole numbers, so all the natural numbers and whole numbers, but the negative versions of them as well. So it includes negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, etc. So that's what we learn next. After that, we learn that there are what we call non-negative rational numbers. Now, what is a rational number? It's a fraction. So we learn there's numbers between one and two, between two and three, between three and four, etc. So we learn that there are numbers between. And at first we learn that these fractions are positive. So that's where the non-negative part comes in. And then rational numbers just means fractions. So these were positive fractions. So the symbol for that is Q, which is a symbol for rational numbers or fractions. And then the plus sign here stands for positive only. So examples of this would be one fourth, one half, three fourths, and one over one, which is one. So if you notice, one isn't been included in every set. One over one is one, 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 and one. So, so we have non-negative rational numbers. Then we learn that there are other rational numbers, there are negatives as well. So the rational numbers are the negative and positive fractions. So in this case, the symbol is Q. And some examples would be negative one half, negative one fourth, and one fourth and one half. After we learn that there's fractions, then we learn that there's real numbers. So real numbers are numbers that can be found on the real number line but don't, but can't be written as fractions of integers. So real numbers, the symbol is R. And some examples of this are like pi, square root of two, E, LN. Those are all examples of real numbers. After real numbers, 
we learned that there were complex numbers. These are the imaginary numbers. The symbol for that is C. And some examples of these would be like I, 2 plus 3, I, and square root of negative 1. So all of these would be complex numbers. So this is the number system. And what you should notice, like I said earlier, is numbers like 1, for instance, are in every set. So any number that's here in the natural numbers is also a whole number. It's also an integer. It's also a non-negative rational number. It's also a rational number and real number and complex number. And it continues to work its way down. So every integer is also a rational, a real, and a complex. So we can continue to look at this and work our way down. So anything, every real number is also a complex number. So numbers can belong to multiple sets at one time, but there's only one set where they directly fall in. It's the first instance of them falling into the set. Now let's talk about the definition of infinite set closure. First of all, what does infinite mean? Infinite means an uncountable number of elements. So it goes on to infinity. It keeps going forever. So an example of this would be like the natural numbers. So we can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we can keep counting. And no matter what number we stop at, there's always a number past it. So that's an infinite number of elements. Therefore, an infinite set means that we cannot count the number of elements in the set. The opposite of this would be a finite set in which there are a countable number of elements. So let's say I wanted the, the natural numbers between 1 and 10. Well, that goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and stops and we can't keep going. So that will be a finite set. So an example of an infinite set would be the set of integers. So there's no limit to the number of integers we can count. Now closure definition, what does closure mean? Closure under an operation means a set is considered to be closed if when that operation is performed on any two elements within the set, the result is also in the set. Okay, note that this must be true for all elements in the set. If there is even one case where the result falls outside the set, then it is considered to be not closed. Okay, so let's take a look at what this means. So here's an example. We have the set of negative 1, 0, and 1, and want to know, is it closed under addition? So what that means is, I'm going to take each of these elements, so like negative 1 and 1, and when I add them together, I get 0, which is in the set. So that's, that means that the set might be closed. If for some reason, though, I end up adding two numbers together, and the result is outside the set. So let's say I add something together and I get 6. Well, 6 is not in the set, so therefore it is not closed. So an example of what would make the set closed would be negative 1 plus 1 equals 0. Because 0 is in the set, it looks like it might be closed. Now, is there an example we can come up with that makes it out of the set? Well, if we add 1 plus 1, because we do need to include it, to, it to plus itself. So 1 plus 1 equals 2. Well, 2 is not in the set, therefore the set is not closed. And again, if there's even one example of this, so it doesn't matter that this part ended up inside the set. Because this one example is out of the set, then the whole set is not closed. So now let's take a look at this infinite set here, the set S of integers, and what we want to know is it closed under addition. Now we can't use a table anymore, so we need to think of some examples of addition of integers and then try to broaden it and say, is there any way that any two integers can be added together and not be an integer? So we do some examples here and we can see that they're still turning out to be integers. So is there any way we can add two integers together and not get an integer? So is there, if I add any two negative integers, is there any way to get a fraction out of it? Is there any way to get a real number out of it? Is there any way to get uh, a complex number out of it? Well, no, there's not, right? Anytime I add any two whole numbers together, I should get another whole number. So therefore, there is no way to add two integers together without getting another integer. So therefore, the set is closed. Now, what about this? The set S of integers closed under division. So again, we're going to think of some examples. So we have 2 divided by 1, 1 divided by 2. Notice here, though, when we do 1 divided by 2, we get 1 half. Well, 
one half is not an integer. That's a rational number. So therefore, when we do it that way, we know that it's not closed. Now, there's an easier way for us to be able to tell that this set is not closed. Because I told you if last time, if we include zero in the set, then it is never closed under division because it's undefined. So if we divide something by zero, it will always be undefined. So zero is an integer. So if we were to divide a set by zero, it would be undefined. So therefore, that previous set would not be closed because of division by zero. Now, what if we said the set of rationals excluding zero is closed under division? Well, again, we're going to think of some examples. So we have one half divided by one fourth is equal to two and negative one half divided by one third. Remember, really, it's just multiplying by the reciprocal. So is there any way we're going to get something other than a rational number, other than a fraction? Well, we keep thinking of some examples. And when we keep looking, we can see that there is no, no way. And we did exclude zero. So we know that zero is not an issue. So we don't have to worry about dividing by zero. So therefore, we can just look at these examples and continue to come up with more examples. And we can see that the set is actually closed because no matter what, when I divide two fractions by each other, I will always get another fraction. Let's take a look now at the reasoning with integers review assignment. Our assignment begins with the learning goals and success criteria. If we scroll down, we can see the questions that we'll be asked to answer. So the first one says, what is the symbol for integers? Well, we should remember that that symbol is Z. So we'll go ahead and mark that one. And we'll scroll down. It says, what is the symbol for natural numbers? Well, we know that's N. And we'll continue to answer each of these questions. What are the factors of 40? Uh, is this set closed? Well, we know that this set is not closed under addition, so we go ahead and click not closed. And we're going to answer each of the questions until we get to the end. Once we get to the end, we'll go ahead and click next. This will take you to your before you go. Go ahead and fill out your before you go and then submit your work on Google Classroom.